Zoom again, and welcome to our face-to-face -face virtual classroom. Our sessions are designed with you in mind to support your child's learning trends and to offer a variety of programs that help to build your knowledge and growth around various topics. We offer weekly classes, which are hosted live, recorded, and then uploaded to our CPS YouTube channel. For future reference, we do hope that you enjoy um, today's session. And again, this is our adolescent health series. This is part three, substance use prevention, alcohol. And so again, for more information on future programming, please visit our website at cpsparentu.org. We thank you for attending today's session. And I'm gonna go ahead and share some information about our presenters. First up, we have Chi, and she is a health educator and AmeriCorps service member at Lori Children's Hospital of Chicago. She has a background in sexual and reproductive health care and education and is passionate about working with young people to help connect them with these services. She also is responsible for creating and facilitating workshops around substance use, substance use for youth and adults. She is excited about starting nursing school next year and about her recent certification to teach yoga. Our second presenter is Neil. Neil is a health educator and AmeriCorps service member at Lori Children's Hospital of Chicago. He graduated from Northwestern University in 2019 with a degree in gender and sexuality studies. Neil has a focus on healthcare for queer folks and health justice. He's also a big fan of science fiction. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to our presenters for today. So let's go ahead and give them a round of applause in the chat box. She and Neil, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, again, just to reintroduce ourselves, my name is Chi, my pronouns are she, her, I'm a health educator. Um, and Neil, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hey everyone, excited to be back. Um, yeah, my name is Neil, I use he, him pronouns, and we're excited to get started. Okay, so today you're going to be talking about alcohol use um, and prevention. So we talked the last couple of weeks about cannabis and vaping, and today we're moving on to alcohol. So a few objectives that we hope you all um, will leave here today knowing how to do. So be able to describe how alcohol affects the body. Um, we're going to identify potential harms and benefits that people associate with alcohol use and examine why teens use alcohol, and then provide you all with tips to use when talking to youth about alcohol, um, as well as ways to talk about prevention and postponement of use. So uh, just a quick way, we want to get to know who is in the room. I know a lot of you have been with us, um, and some of you have not been with us in the previous sessions. We're going to do a quick poll everywhere. Um, and I will put the link to that in the chat. So if you haven't used Poll Everywhere before, um, you can either text that number um, or that phrase, OK Fern 761, so the number 37607, or you can go to the website. And I see Neil put both of them in the um, chat box for you all. So the first question, so just to get an idea of what um, substance use in general, what that education was like when you were in school. Um, so you can go ahead and answer that question here. So what was your substance use education like when you were in school? And maybe you had no substance use education, so you can say that as well.
And also feel free to type these in the chat box. I know Poll Everywhere can be a little bit difficult to get how to use it first. Okay, so some people, you know, not being able to recall what they've learned. So that might be, you know, a common thing as well. Oops, and I realized I did not activate this. So let me activate and then your responses should be coming in. Okay, so some people had dare and abstinence only. So yeah, I think dare is like a abstinence only program. Um, I don't know if they're still around, but I know when I was, um, I think even before I was really in high school, that was a popular program. I think in like the 90s, early 2000s. So dare. So school-wide assemblies where we had videos and presenters come, videos and presenters come, um, contraceptive. So yeah, for like sex ed, um, I think a lot of the um, sometimes sex ed and substance use education might have been similar. So dare. So I see a lot of people. Um, and let me make this full screen. Had dare in their schools. Okay, and then just moving on. So I'm going to go to the next question. So just want to kind of want to get an idea of what your education was like. Um, and then keeping that in mind, I want folks to describe one word. Um, with how they want their child to feel when learning about substances. So think about the education you had, um, what was missing or what did you really like about it? And then what, using one word, describe how you would want your child to feel when learning about substances or substance use. So curious, comfortable. I think those are, I think it's definitely you know, curiosity, it's okay to be curious. I think especially, you know, a middle school and high school age, youth are gonna be curious. Um, definitely feeling comfortable to like ask questions about substances. Um, and we're gonna talk about, you know, ways to have that conversation and ways to make things comfortable for you. Um, informed is definitely a good one. Um, wise being able to ask questions, not afraid. Yeah, so I'm loving these responses. So I think, you know, and we see comfortable is big. So that means a lot of people are using that word and saying that they want their child or children to feel comfortable, um, responsible. So we're gonna talk about all of that today. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing um, just so we can have enough time to get through the rest of the presentation and I'll hand it back to Neil to share. Okay, so we're just gonna go over some general participant guidelines. Thank you all for participating in that um, poll everywhere. Um, so just some safer space tips. If you've been with us, you've probably seen this before, so I'm not going to go through them too in depth. Um, but just one person talking at a time, um, trying to use I statements um, for things that like aren't facts. So things like I like pie and not pie is the best. Um, just being kind to each other in this space. I think we all have different experiences, different family experiences with substance use. So just keeping that in mind. Um, we definitely want folks to feel comfortable asking questions they have um, about substances or how to talk to the youth in their life about substance use, particularly alcohol use in this case. Um, you can definitely don't have to share personal stories, so feel free to keep things general. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about individual situations like, oh, my child came home drunk last weekend, you don't have to say all that, just keep it general. Um, and in that same vein, privacy. So if someone does happen to share something private, you know, keeping that in this space. Um, and there's self-care. Again, a lot of families and people might have histories of substance use. 
Um, so just feeling free to like turn your camera off, um, just taking a break, getting some water, things like that. Okay, so just thinking about these questions, you can just think about them to yourself. You don't have to answer them um, to the group or in the chat or anything like that. But like, what might you want young people um, or why might young people want to or not want to use alcohol? And then also asking ourselves, um, what if any conversations have we had with the young people in our lives about alcohol? Okay, and feel free again, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat box and I will try to stop and answer them. Um, so what is alcohol? Um, so alcohol is a substance produced by the fermentation or the breakdown of sugars. It's found in a lot of different um, drinks such as beers, wines, distilled liquors. It's been produced for thousands of years by humans and it's classified as a depressant. So drugs come in different categories. Um, so, you know, depressant drugs slow down the brain, um, things like stimulants, things like caffeine. We might drink coffee in the morning to wake us up. Depressants kind of have that opposite effect. So it depresses our central nervous system. Um, and it's the most common type of depressant that is used. So then looking at the effects of alcohol, um, so some short-term effects, Ooh, give me one second. So some short-term effects, it can cause mood swings and aggression. Um, it can lead to accidents and injuries, cause vomiting. People, people may have loss of consciousness or awareness. Um, they may have hangovers, diminished academic performance, trouble with law enforcement. Um, and then also for people who uh, might have depression or anxiety, they are at increased risk to harm themselves um, when they are drinking. And then looking at more long-term effects, what well, can frequent um, alcohol use cause? So of course it can lead to serious drinking problems such as alcoholism. It can cause scarring of the liver, damage to our body organs, such as you know, our heart, our liver, our brain. Um, it can lead to impairments in cognitive function. And I think this is really important when we think about, you know, the brain doesn't stop developing till we are 25. So for youth, especially if they're using substances frequently like alcohol, that can pose, um, that can be a risk factor. And then um, it can also cause ulcers or ulcers or bleeding in the stomach, esophagus and mouth. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, and then looking at the next slide, so effects of um, alcohol consumption. So with different amounts of alcohol, like trying to think about how much is too much. So most people may drink um, a low to moderate amount to get certain effects. So just feelings of relaxation, lowered inhibition and increased sociability. When people are drinking larger amounts though, this can lead to a lot of negative side effects. So things like dizziness, nausea, vomiting, um, slurred speech, slower reflexes, which can be a problem for like if someone is driving, um, it can cause sleepiness, impaired judgment and dehydration. And then of course there's the risk of overdose. So this can lead to, you know, a complete loss of motor control, blackouts, coma, and death. Um, and then looking at the next slide, so just to get an idea, so this image is from the Illinois Youth Survey from 2018. Um, so they sur surveyed students across the state of Illinois to look at how much, to look at, you know, if students had drank over the past 30 days. And we can see that in 2018, um, you know, most, even 2018, most youth aren't drinking. So even in 12th grade, less than 50% of students were, had drank alcohol in the past 30 days. But you know, these, it still does tell us that youth are drinking. So even in eighth grade, um, about almost 25% of youth had had alcohol in the past 30 days. Um, so this just means we need to really be aware, you know, that it is something that youth are doing. It is something that youth are exposed to. Um, so how can we, instead of having conversations of like, you know, just don't do it, how can we have more um, open and honest conversations um, and really talk about safety around alcohol use? 
And I think that idea is especially important, the idea of safety. If we go to the next slide, um, it has an image of drinking and driving. Again, this is information from um, the Illinois Youth Survey. So this caption reads, Neil, you go to the next slide. Um, so drinking and driving is the most deadly and pervasive consequence of alcohol use. It can injure or kill not only those responsible, but others in the car and innocent drivers as well. While rates of drinking and driving among Illinois youth have been declining, a quarter of high school seniors reported riding with a drunk driver or driving drunk in 2018. This means that one in four high school seniors is at direct risk of a drunk driving accident. Um, so we can see, although like a majority of youth, especially by 12th grade, are not drinking, um, it is it still is posing a really big, um, you know, health risk and safety risk. So it's important that we are having these conversations with youth. Um, and next, thinking to that question, so you know, why do youth want to use alcohol? You know, there's a variety of different reasons. But one reason that we do hear a lot and that youth do bring up a lot when we ask this question is because of stress or because of mental health that they might have. Um, so when we look at these things, these are coming from studies that we pulled these from. So teens and adolescents who have ADHD, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder and depression have an increased chance of alcohol and substance use. Um, and then 30 to 45 percent of adolescents and young adults with mental health disorders also have a substance use disorder. Um, so have, you know, a documented medical condition with, you know, using substances. Um, there's a little image at the bottom that will pop up next. So this was from the uh, 2018 voice survey, um, which asked students in Illinois, you know, they asked them that same question, why do you think people drink alcohol? Um, and a lot of their answers were, um, were around mental health. Um, so this is something, you know, not only to be thinking, okay, like youth are drinking, that's a problem, but also getting to the reasons why youth may be drinking so we can work on addressing those reasons. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit um, later, like how to address, you know, mental health. Um, substance use is also a really, or identity is also is a really big um, reason why youth use substances like alcohol, um, that more likely to use substances than heterosexual adolescents. Um, this isn't just because of their, you know, identity, just because of their identity of the drinking, but they're drinking and turning to substances to cope with bullying or discrimination they may be facing um, from other people because of their identity. And then 39 to 70% of youth experiencing homelessness use drugs and alcohol. Um, so youth who are, you know, housing and stable, all, and stable also have, um, you know, a higher chance of using substances to cope with that, you know, stress that's coming with that housing instability. Are there any questions? I want to make sure I'm not going too fast. Okay, and then on the next slide, so I won't show this right now, um, but this is again from the Illinois Youth Survey. So if you click on this link, um, and I'll drop it in the chat as well as a few more places you can go to. Um, it's kind of cool because it just has, it shows, splits it up by neighborhood and you can click on whatever your neighborhood is like, um, you know, Belmont, Cragen, and you can see what certain behaviors are like among youth in that neighborhood. Um, so that's one place you can go to and I'll drop two more in the chat as well. Um, and you will all get access to these slides. So you can definitely feel free to look at this more um, on your own. Are there any questions before we move into the next section? No? Okay, then I will let Neil take it from here. Awesome. Thanks, Chi. Um, just as a heads up to everybody, uh, my computer is a little bit slow. So if I start to glitch or you can't hear me, uh, just let me know uh, in the chat or just come off of mute. Um, 
But yeah, so next we're gonna talk about strategies to promote youth safety. So like Chi said earlier, um, we do talk, for example, when we talk to young people, we do talk to them about primary prevention, so delaying or abstaining from use, but we also wanna acknowledge that there are young people who do use um, various substances, including alcohol. And so we want to talk about it um, in a way that uh, allows young folks to access resources, feel safe, um, and if, if and when they're ready to take that step, um, change their relationship to those substances. So these next few slides might look familiar um, from the past two weeks, but if they are new to you, um, feel free to ask any questions or anything like that um, in the chat. So let's talk about harm reduction. So harm reduction involves strategies aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with certain activities. Um, so I'm gonna ask you on this next slide, um, what are some examples of harm reduction that you know of and that you're aware of? Yeah, do you want me to share the poll everywhere for this one? Um, I think we'll, I think we'll just do it in the chat, um, or if people want to come off of mute. So what are some examples of harm reduction you might have seen? Some examples that um, I've seen, um, just like focus groups. Um, so just having um, different uh, focus groups um, where like teachers can help students if they have like certain problems regarding substance abuse or if there is an advisor or different stakeholders. Yeah, for sure. Like connecting students to safe adults and resources. Um, is an example of harm reduction, like making sure that we're bringing people into communities of care is a phrase that I've heard from the Drug Policy Alliance talking about harm reduction um, is really important. And I see in the chat sunscreen is one. So for example, if we're thinking about like being safe uh, when we're out in the sun, like from UV rays and all of that, um, the only way to be 100% safe from that is to never go outside and never see the sun, which is not possible, right? Um, so sunscreen is a way to reduce potential harm um, that can come. Same with seatbelts, right? The only way to 100% be safe from car accidents is to never drive and never get in a car. Also not possible. So seatbelts reduce potential harm. Um, and I see therapy in there as well. Yeah, again, thinking of that community of care, different um, people you can turn to. Masks, yeah, that's a huge one right now with this pandemic, right? Um, it's not possible to completely like disconnect from the world and like only stay inside. We need to go out for food, whatever. We might be essential workers, um, things like that. Uh, so, so masks are a huge one. So these are great ideas still coming in the chat. Feel free to keep going. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep, keep rolling with the presentation. So harm reduction involves strategies aimed at reducing negative consequences, like I said earlier. It incorporates a spectrum of strategies. So it's not just like one thing. Um, so they, the image is covering it a little bit, but that, uh, that says uh, safer use or managed use. Um, abstinence is one thing that people can do to reduce harm. Um, it involves meeting people who use substances where they're at. So not kind of coming in being like, you should do this or need to be doing that, but more like, okay, let's talk about what your substance use looks like now and uh, what you want to see out of that relationship with substances you might have. Um, and then it also addresses conditions of use. So um, we're not just talking about one person using one substance or uh, some substances. We're also thinking about their environment and um, what are some reasons they might turn to substances and what are some things that might make it easier to change their relationship with substance use. It doesn't minimize or ignore harms with substance use. Uh, so we are, when we talk about harm reduction, we do talk about the potential harm. And then it applies evidence-based strategies to reduce negative consequences of behavior. So we ground our work in um, research. So I know a lot of people talked about DARE earlier, um, and that would be an example, uh, wouldn't be an example of harm reduction, excuse me, would not be an example. And the reason for that is it only talks about abstinence. 
and it doesn't address the conditions uh, under which why somebody might use. And there, there are various other studies showing that there is doesn't really do anything to change rates of substance use. Um, and somewhere, if you correct me if I'm wrong, there was an article somewhere that um, is in our notes that says uh, it actually had the opposite effect. Um, it had a harmful effect um, with using substances. So why harm reduction? Um, so yeah, meets people where they're, where they're at um, and doesn't leave them there. Uh, it reduces morbidity and mortality it keeps folks engaged if using substances. So a lot of a lot of programs might have like a if you say or try to quit using, but you start using again, you're no longer welcome in this program. That removes people from care, um, and that's not what we we're trying to do when thinking about harm reduction. It reaches vulnerable youth populations. It creates personalized health promotion strategy and collaboration with the person um, instead of like a, you should be doing this kind of thing. It respects people's rights um, and their own understanding of their lives and their bodies. It recognizes inherent str strengths, excuse me, and motivations to do well. Um, and it helps, uh, it helps youth help friends. So something else that's really important with harm reduction is reducing stigma. So stigma prevents people from seeking care or treatment um, because of the, the perceptions of somebody who uses substances might be very negative. Um, and then attitudes towards substance use can impact uh, communities and policies and uh, the ways they're enforced as well. In our cannabis presentation, um, for those of you who are there, we talked a lot about how cannabis regulation and um, policing has disproportionately impacted communities of color and specifically black communities. Um, so justice and racial justice in particular is a part of harm reduction. Any questions so far on harm reduction? I know that was a lot of, a lot of content. Yeah, we do have one question, Neil, and it's, um, do you have support groups for youth and resources for youth and parents? Yeah, so um, I know that Lurie has several programs um, with substance use. I can drop a link in the chat or Chi if you have it um, to that web page. Um, but if you can, I can it. drop it in. Um, so the, with this information is on our website. Um, so we currently, I don't think, have any support groups for patients and families. But I know that's something that they are working on doing. Um, so I will drop that in the um, chat box and it says all the programs they're working on, you know, they hope to incorporate in the future as well as the ones we already have. So, cool. Um, as the questions keep coming in, feel free to, to keep asking. So uh, strategies to promote safety, uh, diving a little deeper into it. Uh, primary prevention, so uh, delaying or avoiding use is the safest strategy. Um, so when we talk to young people about it, we let them know that um, their brains are still developing, um, human brains develop until they're 25, and alcohol use can uh, impact that development process. Um, we also let young folks know that uh, delaying or avoiding use can be a one evening kind of choice or it can be like a long term lifestyle choice um, for religious reasons, cultural reasons or personal reasons. Um, so keeping in mind that uh, young people can and do use alcohol, uh, we also let them know that it's dangerous to mix substances. Um, so for example, uh, mixing narcotic pain pills, heroin, or benzos uh, can increase the risk of a fatal overdose with alcohol. Um, and that's because of the class of um, substance, like alcohol is a depressant, as are those, um, those other substances listed in the little image. And that can lead to some um, pretty dangerous situations, including overdose and death. So knowing the correct dosages is another way to reduce potential harm. Um, so knowing what you're putting in your body um, and knowing what the symptoms of alcohol poisoning are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but alcohol poisoning is when a person drinks so much alcohol that its depressant effects begin to shut down basic life support functions such as breathing, heart rate, and temperature control. 
Um, and then we also talked to young folks about uh, what a standard drink is. And there's another slide about that um, coming up. So we do this activity with, with young folks, but um, it's also easier when we're in person and we can like show them. But we talk about how like red solo cups, for example, pretty common at um, parties and things like that, um, have lines on them to, to measure out how much alcohol you're pouring, uh, depending what, what type of alcohol it is. So the one at the, the line at the very bottom um, is for like distilled liquors, vodka, things like that. Um, the line in the middle-ish is for wine and the lines towards the top are for beer. And then we also compare uh, different quantities of alcohol as well. So like, uh, the, um, like the amount of liquid that you drink in a can of beer, uh, you cannot do the same thing with like vodka, like that's, they contain different amounts of alcohol. So recognizing the symptoms of alcohol poisoning is really important. Um, so these are the steps that we talk to young folks about, recognize the symptoms, uh, what to do. So calling 911 or a trusted adult and putting the person in recovery position. So the first one, uh, recognizing the symptoms, uh, this acronym CUPS is useful, uh, cold, clammy skin, unconsciousness, puking, especially if the person is passed out, and slowed or irregular breathing are all uh, good symptoms that someone is uh, experiencing alcohol poisoning. A lot of young folks are understandably worried that if uh, they call the police uh, for a medical emergency, they might not be safe for various reasons, or they might get in trouble for underage drinking. So Illinois has something called the Illinois Medical Amnesty Law, which protects teens from getting into trouble if they're calling um, to report alcohol poisoning to connect that person to care. Um, so that's something really important to keep in mind. Um, if there's an emergency, uh, you won't get in trouble legally. Um, we also let youth know that it might be a very difficult decision to call 911, given that they might not know if they are safe if law enforcement gets involved, um, especially if they're a person of color or specifically a black person. Um, so in that case, we let youth know that calling a trusted adult is what you should do in that situation. So is there a, a parent or a family member or a family friend that you can call who you know will have your back. They'll come pick you up, take you to the hospital or take you and your friend to the hospital, whoever's experiencing alcohol poisoning. And the last one um, is putting the person who is experiencing alcohol poisoning into the recovery position and that's to avoid them choking on their own vomit while they're passed out. So I'm gonna play this video. Let me know if you can't hear it. Hi, I'm going to show you how to perform a simple maneuver that could help save your friend's life if they're drunk and fall asleep. Our goal here is to make sure your friend won't choke on their vomit if they're drunk and sleeping on their back. Step one is to raise the arm closest to you above your friend's head. Prepare yourself to roll the body towards you. Step two, gently roll the person as a unit so they are lying on their side. Remember to guard your friend's head as you roll them. Step three, tilt your friend's head to maintain their airway. Tuck their nearest hand under their cheek to help maintain the head tilt. Remember to continue to check on your friend often. Knowing how to perform this simple maneuver can help save your friend's life. Learn more useful tips at www.nigregion.ca. Awesome, any questions before we keep rolling along? Um, so this slide might look familiar if you were here um, the previous weeks. Sorry, can everybody hear and see me okay? If I can get a thumbs up. Okay, I see a thumbs up, great. Um, my computer is like glitching, so I'm unsure. Um, so developing other strategies for stress relief. So like she said earlier, um, a lot of youth report uh, turning to substances to deal with uh, stress and life challenges. Um, and so a good way to avoid 
avoid doing that, leaning on substances, is to develop other ways to deal with stress. Um, so we, we talk about uh, running, uh, like physical activity, yoga, meditation, uh, getting creative. Um, we've had we've had young folks say video games. We've had a, we've had a, a young person say like they like to punch things and like pillows and stuff, and we let them know as long as it's a pillow and not a person, that's also all right. So uh, this is a summary of the past few slides um, about uh, promoting youth safety. Um, something that we include on this slide uh, for young folks is having uh, a trusted adult um, that you can ask questions to, or if you need help and support that you feel safe turning to. Um, and throughout, throughout our uh, presentation, um, we make sure that young people are thinking about those, those trusted adults in their life. It's also important to talk about consent um, when talking about substance use. So this acronym, um, FRIES, um, from this graphic from Planned Parenthood, um, says that consent is freely given, um, so it's not coerced or anything. It's reversible, so a yes today doesn't mean a yes tomorrow or even in five minutes. Um, it's informed, so people know what they're consenting to. It's enthusiastic, so you know, like no, like yeah, I guess, um, but like, like someone's into it, um, and then it's specific. So, um, an, like an example would be like, yes, I want tea, but that does not mean like yes, I want coffee. Um, and so we also let young folks know that um, all those things need to go into giving or obtaining consent and using substances, including alcohol, can make that uh, difficult or impossible. So if a person is drinking a lot and like they're not capable of like standing up, like that means they're definitely not capable of giving consent um, and things like that. So some tips for the talk. Um, so when you are sitting your young person down and talking to them about substance use, um, starting by asking general questions can be really good. That way you're not um, Kind of interrogating them but you're more just being curious about like what's going on in your young person's life so do kids at school like instead of do you like um or open-ended questions like so what do you know about alcohol use um can be a lot more easy to start a conversation than do you use alcohol or do you drink um keep an open mind um i think a lot of times especially as people who care about young folks, like there are certain certain answers that we don't want to hear, but um, it's important to keep in mind that if that person is telling you that yes, they use or they have friends who use or whatever, they trust you enough to share that information with you. Um, and keeping an open mind can be really important. Um, put yourself in your young person's shoes. Um, so kind of try and speak from a place of empathy and understanding. Um, be clear about your goals. So if you have your own expectations about substance use um, in your own space if, um, or in your own home, um, that's totally okay to articulate to your young person. Um, and also for the conversation itself, if you have certain goals, like I, I want my young person to know this, this and that about um, alcohol use, or I want my young person to be able to recognize the symptoms of alcohol poisoning after this conversation. Um, you can let them know that. Um, be calm and relaxed. Um, yeah, I see in the chat, uh, before I dive into that, uh, tips for the talks. Um, this conversation is definitely one that's ongoing. It's hard to deliver. I mean, this, this series is now three weeks in length. Um, it's hard to deliver this information um, all at once. So keeping this ongoing uh, helps make the information digestible. And then it also lets them know that whether it's tomorrow or whether it's like three years from now, like you are somebody they can come to and ask for support. Um, yeah, so be calm and relaxed. Body language is a big one. I know that's the last one, but um, like try, try and relax a little bit and like be ready for whatever your young person might ask you or disclose to you as best as you can. Um, be positive, and don't lecture. And then find a comfortable setting. Um, so like, you know, like, right before they have a huge exam, like sitting down and talking about uh, substance use might not be the best time to do that. Um, but being in a place where your young person feels safe to ask questions that might be sensitive or that, um, you know, they're, they're not in public or things like that, where they might feel uncomfortable.
And so right here we have a bunch of resources. I'll leave this, I'll leave this up, but you'll have access to this presentation as well. Um, but at this point, um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, um, ask in the chat or come off of mute. And then we can also share um, our poll everywhere. So if you want to ask anonymously, you can do that as well. Take it away, Chi. Yes, yeah, so I will share the poll everywhere. So like Neil mentioned, you can ask in the um, chat or you can ask in the poll everywhere if you do not want. Um, if it's a more you know personal private question. Um, so I will share this. Um, so feel free and I'll make it full screen. So feel free to ask um, and get in the chat box or um, in the poll everywhere. So again, if it's you're doing the poll everywhere, you can go to the website poll ev.com slash okfern761 or you can text okfern761 to 37607. Hello, hi, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me clearly? Okay, I am wondering if there are places where you can go, I see you just had a list of resources, but I'm wondering like, okay, say, you know, you or someone's living with someone that, you know, is, um, you know, using, it could be an adult, you know, what have you, and they have questions or things of that sort, and they're asking you, maybe you don't know, you know, specifically, is there a place where you can go where they may feel comfortable? I remember back in the day, there was some, like you can go say, for instance, maybe uh, there's a, a, a female or a male maybe in a household and they're, you know, using maybe either, you know, drugs or uh, alcohol, what have you. But there were places that you can go. I don't know if it's called al I or something like that, but places where you can go to support yourself because you're going through something at home that maybe you can't deal with or you need some sort of support or counseling. Are there still places like that around where you can, you know, go to? I don't know if that's like a, it's not a 12 step program, but I'm just wondering because I don't hear a lot about that, like out, you know, and about as far as, you know, edu being educated or just going to, you know, just get some kind of help or support. So I don't know what that would be called or what that is, you know, um, but it seemed like Al and I or something is coming to mind, but I don't remember what exactly that does you know, in regards to, yeah, that, do you know any information? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would be, it kind of sounds like you're saying like a drop-in type service um, that students can go or that young people can go to. Um, I know, at Lurie Children's Hospital, we do have um, like counseling around substance use for youth. Um, right now, I think it's just individual counseling and therapy sessions. Um, I think they're trying to add, you know, support groups into that mix. Um, but right now, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's specifically um, like for youth. Um, that's a drop in center to talk about um, mental health. Um, I know there are some organizations um, that deal with mental health and that work with youth around mental health. Um, and I will type it in the chat now. I've worked with them in the past. Um, if I can find the chat. So it's called The Corner Store um, Chicago. Neil, have you heard of anything else? No, nothing that's coming to mind. I, this is Gloria. I'm, I'm thinking about social service agencies that offer up um, programs, um, which we probably can brainstorm about and then checking in with the school counselor as well. But I'm definitely thinking, I know on the West side, there's an organization for adults and it's above and beyond and it's a family recovery center. So I'm kind of thinking of 
those kinds of um, entities, Bridget. So we'll um, work on something. And we we'll can work. take a note of that, okay. yeah, and get back mm -hmm. to you um, if we can find anything like more specific. Sounds great. Thank you all so much. Um, I see in the poll everywhere, there's another question. Are children less likely to drink or use substances if parents do not uh, openly drink or abuse substances? Um, so as far as rates and like things like that, I am unsure, Chi, if you have anything. But I will say that um, for substances that uh, like alcohol or recently like cannabis, where you have, there's an age limit, like 21 and older, um, we can definitely model uh, responsible substance use um, and and things like that. Um, Chi, if you have any any thoughts. Yeah, I'm not too sure on the exact um, statistics around that myself. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it really, a lot of it has to do with having these conversations with youth um, about, you know, what your expectations are of them when it comes to substance use, but also, um, making sure they know like how to stay safe as well. Um, we talked about like, you know, how to, you know, help a friend if they're in a situation um, and just making sure even if you're the, per even if you don't feel comfortable being that person who's like coming to get them an emergency if they're like at a party and making sure they have that person um, in their life. Um, and then also just, you know, making sure they feel like they have someone to reach out to if they are, you know, stressed, if they are like having anxiety or signs of like depression, um, making sure they're connected with resources on that end, whether it be, you know, a school counselor um, or another, you know, avenue. Because I, like we said, I think that is where we see um, like the not just use, but the misuse side. Um, and abuse side of substances coming in when there are um, mental health issues and mental health conditions going on at the same time. Um, and then if your child um, help, um, so we will share, we will sh share that with you all. Um, again, at Larry Children's, we do have a substance use, um, you know, substance use therapy for um, youth. That's really good. Um, I don't think our social worker is on tonight, um, but you can call that number or go to the website um, in the presentation we'll give you that has information about um, how to reach out to us and how to get connected with our clinical staff. These are great questions. Are there any other, let me look at the chat real quick. Any other questions? questions? Um, so I think for Lurie, um, yes, I'm not exactly sure um, what, types of, what type of insurances that are accepted um but if you call that number it might even say on the website um that i linked earlier but if you call the number they should be able to say um what um you know what services that they are able um, or what insurances that they accept and if there are sliding fee scale options as well Um, and then let's answer this last question. So are there consequences for adults who allow underage drinking parties in their homes? Um, can I report an adult who allows my high schooler to drink in their home? Um, so I will say yes. Um, so there are, like I mentioned, Neil mentioned before, there are laws that protect, protect youth in terms of, um, like if they're calling 911 because they need help because there's a medical emergency, there are um, avenues to protect that person calling and the person who needs the medical attention from getting in trouble with the law. Um, when it comes to you know adults who let youth or even if they don't let youth, 
Um, even if the parents don't know, if there's a party at that home, there can be um, consequences for their adults as well. Um, you know, endangering welfare of children, they can be charged with things like that. Um, so that being said, I think, yes, you can report adults who are, it's something that you can do. Um, but I think a first step would definitely be, um, you know, speaking with that adult first. I think a lot of times when the law is involved in situations like this, it can have repercussions for not only the adult, but the youth in the situation as well. Um, and I think just having conversations with that adult as well, say like letting them know your expectations that you, if they know your, your child is drinking in their home, um, like letting them know that is not okay, that is not something that you um, want your child to be doing. Um, you can even just make it so, you know, maybe your child doesn't go over to that person's house, but you allow them to be in your home instead. Um, so I think when thinking about this, um, at least on our end, we always want to see like, how can we foster that idea of harm reduction, even when thinking about the law um, and ways we like other steps we can take for first before reporting that um, kind of thing to law enforcement. Neil, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Um, no, nothing, nothing major. I think that was, that was great. Um, yeah, I guess the thing that comes to mind is like keeping in mind, like uh, if, if your young person is drinking at somebody's home um, and that they're relatively, relatively safe there, like they're not going out, they're not, um, they're not operating any motor vehicles, things like that. Um, a conversation with that adult might like give you more information that like maybe they didn't know that there were young people drinking at their house or maybe they had like a I'd rather you drink at home than go out and like drink like I don't know somewhere where they can't supervise you and keep an eye out um but yeah exactly like what you mentioned like a, an adult um can get into a lot of trouble for um having underage drinking in their home Okay, um, it is 5.02, or four, five, yeah, five oh two. Um, I do not wanna take up any more of your time. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this. If people do have questions, um, just so we're able to answer them all, I do wanna leave you all with um, a Google form for one to be able to just evaluate this session and then also just to be able to ask any questions um, that you might still have lingering. So I'm gonna drop that link in the chat. I don't know if it was already put in here. Um, if you could just fill out that Google form, it should take about five minutes. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chi and Neil. Our session has come to an end and we hope that you enjoyed today's class, which was part of our Adolescence Health Series Substance Use Prevention um, Series, Alcohol. And please remember that if you have attended all three sessions, you will receive a certificate. And so again, just remember that our classes are recorded and you can find them on our YouTube channel, which that information will be dropped into the chat box. And you can also visit our cpsparentu.org website to get more information there. And please follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to sign up to receive information about future programming. And I'm just looking in the chat box. So you will have two surveys to complete and don't forget to join us for um, programming next week. We know that you have many choices when it comes to virtual sessions. We thank you so much for joining ours. Be careful as you move about the remainder of the evening. You may experience a slight information overload, but it's all um, for um, a higher purpose and to have that information um, for our young people 
um, so that they can be informed. And so we thank you. Have a great evening. Let me check the chat box one more time. Oh, make sure you leave your email address if you want the PowerPoint um, presentation. So I know a few people, you dropped your email into the chat box and we thank you. So if you want to receive this presentation, go ahead, drop your information into the chat box. We're gonna hang around and make sure that we have your email addresses. And then let us know. I know you have to complete a survey, but feel free to drop some emojis in there, drop a 10 in there. If you have smiley faces, if you want to clap or anything to let our presenters know um, how they did today. It was fabulous, very informative. Yes, thumbs up. This is important. And um, yeah, great information. All right. We thank you so much. Have a great evening. Our session has officially ended and we're gonna hang around just to uh, wrap up here. So face staff, if you can hang around. Everyone else have a great evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Great job on all three workshops. Yes, very informative, absolutely.